Good evening, everyone. We want to thank you for joining us on a Sunday night here at Hip Hop Citizen live stream show. I'm the diva and these are my views. This is the Sunday special report where we talk about topical items that are hip hop adjacent. And we want to thank you for tuning in. We're going to give everybody a chance to get in here and enjoy the show. We are streaming on all platforms. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitch. So we hope that you'll follow us, like, share, subscribe, uh, give us a thumbs up. And if you're listening to us in the replay, thank you so much for finding us and coming here. We hope that you'll subscribe and follow us and like the page on Facebook. You can find me at It's Diva Views on Instagram and Diva View Citizen on Facebook. Tonight we have our friend Dialect 718 on the boards, and we hope that you'll stay with us for this very in depth discussion that we're having. Now, this is part two of the series we were doing Do All Black Lives Matter to All Black People? Uh, last week we covered a variety of topics. We talked about Chicago, we talked about uh, relationships, we talked about what we can do to volunteer in the community. And so we hope that you'll go back and watch that show and have the continuation of this show as a follow up. So we appreciate your time coming in here and speaking with us. Now we were going to have a guest with us, uh, Ruku, but his wife is in labor. So we want to congratulate them and wish them a safe and healthy delivery. I believe he'll be joining us next week and we'll discuss that topic towards the end of the show. So let's get started with a housekeeping note first. We're just going to discuss some things since the show is picking up some viewers and it's very topical. And I want to, you know, state again that these are my views, but it's important that we have a discussion that's a civil discourse. And I'm going to be looking at my notes on the computer a lot. So if you see me turn my head, that's what I'm doing. I take a lot of notes and do a lot of editing. So that's all I'll be looking at. Um, I have a quote here from George Eliot from the book Middlemarch. It says, it is a narrow mind which cannot look at a subject from various points of view. And that's where opinions come in because opinions matter, but they should never be disrespected or disrespect shouldn't be tolerated for your opinion. Now, just because you don't like what you hear, don't rail against the person, go after the issue. And especially now with opinions being challenged and monitored uh, because people speak on them. Uh, people speak, it speaks to a person's thinking. It speaks to a person's behavior and their decision-making on the matter. That's why opinions seem to mean so much to everybody and they're all screaming their opinions into the void. But a person's opinion could affect another person's life either positively or negatively. And James Baldwin, I love his quotes that are coming up lately, said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. And really, that's what it all comes down to. Now, it's one thing to say, I don't like Hawaiian pizza. Um, it's another to say same sex couples shouldn't be allowed to adopt. Those are two completely different ideas and be able to defend your stance but be open to learning about your stance and why others may disagree. That's what this show is gonna do, bring you the information, you can make your own decisions about what you hear tonight, and then go out and find the resources to inform yourself and make sure you're getting them from the correct sources. We've had a discussion on media literacy on this channel. I encourage you to go find that video. We had a great discussion with uh, Gabriel Tolliver in that regard, and we hope that you'll stay with us to continue hearing about topical discussions that are hip hop adjacent on the Sunday Special Report. Let's go ahead and dive into our discussion tonight. Do all black lives matter to all black people? And the discussion we're going to start with is the diaspora. So the African diaspora is what we want to discuss when it comes to black Americans. And the African diaspora refers to many communities of people of African descent that disperse throughout the world as a result of historic movements. Now, the majority of the African dispersal did result from the Arabic and Atlantic slave trades, the largest forced migration in history. So an estimated 11 million Africans were dispersed from the Atlantic slave trade from Western Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Central Africa, so Congo and Cameroon, with an estimated 10 to 80 million from the Arabic slave trade. Now, despite popular association with the United States, it's most often discussed here and in this frame, only 5% of African slaves went to the Americas, while the remaining 95% went to South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. 
So alike, African-Americans and other Africans in the diaspora um, include Afro-Cubans, Afro-Brazilians, um, Afro-Costa Ricans. Uh, they face challenges in their countries and we all share a common history and that's where that comes from. So the slide we have here talks about the political culture. Now, uh, what happened is that we started to get into pan-Africanism, the identity focused on the African diaspora, everybody around the world sharing this common culture. Now, nationalism is an identity focused on transgenerational black community. And that's how we wanna break down what the discussion is gonna be about when we say the diaspora. It's also considered a term that's used to express the links and commonalities among groups of African descent throughout the world. And members of the diaspora, from hip hop standpoint, you can think of Akon, uh, Wale, maybe others that I'm not referring to right now. I'm sure some others occur to you in the hip hop community. One of the things that I wanna discuss with the diaspora is that a lot of people don't identify with everybody around the world, but there are not just black people here. Black people are kind of unique to America. We have our own shared background. We have a collective consciousness of what we've experienced here. But there are British Africans, there are French African citizens, there are black people in Germany, Russia, uh, everywhere that you find a country, you could probably find us at this point. So the diaspora looms large in the way that we were migrated and the way that we migrated ourselves. So we want to keep that in mind when we're talking about Black people around the world. Uh, we often want to make that distinction uh, between the Africans, African Americans, if you're considered a Black person or if you just want to be known by your nationality, hyphen where you're living currently. There's ethnic identity, there's eth ethno-religious identity. There are many ways to talk about someone who's in the diaspora. Now, something that we also want to discuss is that um, there is this idea that African-Americans are often viscerally upset when it comes to the idea of the transatlantic slave trade because the refrain that we're hearing so much lately is that black people sold black people. And one thing that we need to keep in mind is that history is not written by the people that history happened to. And there's a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quote that says, we are not makers of history. We are made by the story. And the idea of that is that it, it happens to you. You don't always get to write the story or who lives to tell your story. And one thing I want to look at is a plaque that was put up in Ghana that I think we have a picture of that had a very, you know, a quote that I really felt and a quote that made sense to the pain that still exists when it comes to the idea of African-American identity uh, staying with Africa, like as a continent, the countries in them and the diaspora and how it affects us. So if we have that image, um, I'd like to take a look at that. Um, this is some great Benin art that we found. We have great sculptures. We have great artists. Um, but the slide I'm referring to is just a plaque in black and white for the picture. Uh, it was a photo contributed by Lucretia uh, Ewing in an article that she had in the Times Free Press. Uh, it was an opinion column from uh, December 14th, 2019, when she discussed a trip she took to Ghana. Uh, during the time when it was a, a year of return, and we're going to be discussing that too as well, the 2019 year of return, which marked the anniversary of the beginnings of the slave trade in the Americas, 1619 to 2019. And the plaque that she had was commemorating the people who were enslaved and taken through the door of no return at the Elmina Slave Castle in Ghana, West Africa. And let me see if I can bring it up because I really wanna read uh, what it said because I think it speaks to how our relationships in the diaspora uh, can be affected by the history that happened to us. And here it is in everlasting memory. And uh, I wanna get the text up to make sure that people really have the idea of acknowledgement of what happened and also you know how we are referring to those people so this is in everlasting memory and let me see if we can get it a little closer here and let's see 
of the ambush of our ancestors, may those who died rest in peace. May those who returned find their roots. May humanity never again perpetrate such injustice against humanity. We, the living, vow to uphold this. And thank you, producer Dialect 718. When I saw this in the article, uh, again, on the Times Free Press, it really spoke to the idea that those who were on the continent, those in Ghana, who feel like there was a time when their ancestors were complicit in the transatlantic slave trade, they're trying to reach out a hand. They're trying to acknowledge it in a way that lets others know in the diaspora that they really are trying to reach back and make a connection at this point that many people may feel is lost. Um, another article that I found in doing my research, like I said, there's a lot of research on here. Um, there's going to be a lot of links. If you're interested in having those links, we'll be happy to put them in the description box on YouTube or put them in the comments on Facebook. One article that I found on africascountry.com was speaking about a film uh, that was made by a small film producer, and it was called Black in Black. Um, and the film is discussed in the article. And I liked what the writer of this article reviewing the film was saying. And she said, while slavery was historically common in some African empires and kingdoms, just as in the rest of the world, its meaning was different. African systems of slavery were often identified by local socio-cultural patterns of clientage and adoptive kinship rather than large-scale commercial enterprise. That part of history also tends to be affected by stereotypes and misconceptions. The role of some Africans as complicit in the slave trade continues to remain a painful aspect of American history. And that's absolutely true. Whoever you talk to in the community, when you bring that up, that's absolutely something that they parrot as well. Well, they sold us. They, you know, shipped us off. They helped. But unscrupulous chiefs selling their fellow Africans to slave traders is not the whole story. And the history also includes acts of resistance, raids, attacks on the European slave traders. And these are important stories to know as well. So that's why we say here that we want you to look those things up as well. And the participation in a lot of uh, raids and the way that they realized how their brothers and sisters were being taken and not even necessarily brothers and sisters because these were not people selling their own people. These were not blacks selling blacks. Uh, the Fulani were selling the Songhai and someone from Congo was coming in and raiding a village in another part of the area. So these were not kins. These were not brethren. These were people who were going on raids or in warfare trading their spoils of war, trading the slaves that they had you know, taken and giving them to people who had a demand for the labor. And there's no denying that. There was a supply and there was a demand. So we have to look at it that way as well. And the cultural differences that made it possible for Africans to be selling other Africans was that they were looking at someone that was in another village and saw them as other saw them as less because there was a cultural difference, a religious difference, a social difference. And that's what made them think that it was okay to have these warfares and raids and attacks and have these people as their slaves. But the participation in the transatlantic slave trade was not all just a line of slaves going onto ships with the okay and stamp of approval from the Africans that were living there at the time. And the diaspora needs to have that discussion just as much as they have to have a discussion about coming together as a unity and community around the world. I found something interesting on the um, website of a school that's the uh, Lower Country Digital History Initiative. Once again, South Carolina coming through with historical evidence that I used in my last broadcast. And the Low Country Digital History Initiative has some fascinating information about the transatlantic slave trade, uh, about the participation in it, and they have a timeline of how it occurred in South Carolina and in other parts of the colonies. Uh, this is a very long link, but we'll see if we can try to get that in the description box or in the comment section for you guys to take a look at, because it's really interesting reading, and I'll see if I can find a couple of great paragraphs that they uh, we're talking about here. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that European traders generally relied on a network of African rulers and traders to capture and bring enslaved Africans from various coastal and interior regions to slave castles on the West and Central African coast. So when I mentioned before, Elmina uh, Castle has the door of no return. 
and I'm sure there are several, but this is the one that tourists seem to go to the most. I know uh, Barack Obama, when he went to West Africa, this is one place he went. And when you stood in the door of no return, the story goes, that you knew that you were not coming back. You saw this large vessel, you saw this large ship. And when you stood in that door, you didn't know if you were coming back to your homeland. You were being taken somewhere else. And that door was the last thing on your soil that you were going to go through and see. Um, I'm sure there's other castles that have other things like that as well. But the door of no return is something that I've definitely read people have stood in and they get this feeling over them. And it's a visceral reaction. There's tears, there's anger, there's anguish standing there and having that thought process go through you that this was someone's uh, last time being on their native soil. And that's important to respect as well, that just because this is not where you were born, that doesn't mean you don't have a connection. So that's important to uh, keep in mind as well. Now, scholars have provided various explanations for why African traders were willing to supply other Africans to Europeans for the slave trade. And this is the early 16th century. Slavery was already playing a major role in West and interior African societies. And it contributed to maritime slavery. There was Arab slavery. There was the Barbary Coast trade. Now, what happened is that and Europeans came in and they took advantage of a pre-existing slave trade system. This was before they came in to obtain labor to expanding plantation colonies in the Caribbean, South America, and to some extent in the Americas. And that's what developed the transatlantic slave trade. So because there was a supply, there became a demand. And these groups often conflicted over internal politics as well as economic expansion. So once the African rulers saw that there was a trade to this, that there was a business to this, that's when they started selling the slaves that they already had to the people that were coming in. And this map that we're looking at shows the path of the transatlantic slave trade. You had British North America, which is the 13 colonies. You had Spanish America sending slaves over to Central America. You had Dutch Caribbean sending them to the D Dutch Caribbean and the Northern um, South American coast. And you had Brazil, which was apparently the majority from my research. You had the British Caribbean, you had the Danish Caribbean, Everyone from Europe was coming down, getting these slaves from West and Central Africa and shipping them across the Atlantic to their various uh, their various plantations, their various islands, the places that they had colonized. And they were exploiting them for labor while the Africans had them as spoils of war, as workers in their economy. And they were amongst themselves. And I found this political cartoon and it's true, there was a scramble for Africa. There were all these countries who thought that because they discovered this place that they felt was a backwater, that it could be easily taken over because they saw people in tribal clothing and they figured they could come in in heels and take over everything. You had the Dutch, you had the British, you had the Spanish, you had the French, everybody wanting to just divide up a place that somebody else was already living with established kingdoms and cultures and religions. And they figured they could just come in and divide it up amongst themselves, get the resources and be on their merry way. And the diaspora took place because of a large historic migration. That's something to understand when it comes to this discussion. And we're following this up with the discussion that we had last week as well. There were so many cultural and ethnic differences. Like I said, you had the Fulani, the Igbo, the Ashanti, the Mendi that the social divisions and frequent conflicts between these groups are what supplied Africans with African slaves. So they were going back and forth, taking captives who would circulate through the different local slave trade systems, but they eventually ended up in the tran transatlantic slave trade because of the bartering that was taking place with African chiefs who were still at war with the local African chiefs. They weren't specifically trying to just go find Africans to supply to these traders for that specific transatlantic slave trade. And that's what people need to break down and understand when they're talking about the relationship that we have with Africans from the continent. Um, it's not that Central and West Africa slavery was prevalent, it's that European demand often expanded the presence 
of the institution and the trade. So what they were going through was European traders were generally working within the terms of African rulers and traders, but as they the chiefs and the African rulers began to realize the extent of the drain on their resources within the country itself, then they began to realize that they had to resist and stop selling and stop letting these people come in and take people from the continent because they knew there was a drain happening on their society, on a societal level. So they began forming raids to take back people. They began forming attacks on the European traders. There was active resistance and rebellion, even on the slaves who were in the ships of the Middle Passage. They knew that they did not want this to take place. And there were Africans on the continent not wanting this to take place to other Africans. So we want to keep that in mind when we talk about the pain from the diaspora and what may not be understood. But the suspicion is still there and people still want to know, you know, is it okay to trust you at this point? It, should we be making a connection? I know there's a lot of suspicion between um, African Americans, Black Americans, how you want to refer to yourself, and the actual Africans who come over, uh, perhaps as immigrants, they emigrated, or perhaps they come over as students in the schools. And they're a little suspicious of each other. They look at each other and kind of side eye. Um, they want to know, like, can you be trusted? There are stereotypes. There are, you know, things that they've heard about each other. They may not know very much about each other. And so because you don't know something, the first thing that comes up is fear. And that fear breeds that suspicion. But we want to try to cast that aside with shows like this to discuss what's going on in how we can educate ourselves to not have those suspicions and have those stereotypes be true. When you're giving somebody the side of you, you're, you're kind of looking like, okay, should I trust you? Because the first thing I learned, um, going to a website called coreac.uk, it was a PDF that I downloaded and read through. And it's basically a white paper. It's great. Peer reviewed, citations, great information in there. I highly encourage you to take a look at it. It's core.ac.uk. You can look specifically for the study that they were doing with the um, Portland University website that they were looking at. And they did a whole paper where they discussed the surveys they did to discuss with other people how they felt about each other. And I wanna read some interesting things that I took away from the study. Basically black immigrants, if they're African descent, British born, Asian born, European born, because like I said, we're everywhere. Um, they see black Americans as lazy, disorganized, obsessed with racial images, and having a laissez-faire attitude toward family life and child raising. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying this is what black immigrants from other countries are seeing about black Americans. Now on their part, native born American blacks view black immigrants as arrogant and oblivious to the racial tensions between black Americans and white Americans that takes place here. Uh, the, what they did was did the survey with 40 African American students from Howard University to render their general concept about Africa. Now, some of the answers they got about stereotypes that the Howard students had heard were that it was the dark continent, mysterious continent, Africa was hot, most kind of no denying that, uh, it had no civilization of its own. It was inhabited by cannibals, heathens, and ferocious animals living in impenetrable jungles. Um, Africans, for their part, come here and they're under a lot of misconceptions that African Americans are losers and don't take advantage of opportunities. So I think that's where the misunderstandings come in, the suspicion comes in, the mistrust, and then the standoffishness that ends up happening. And I can see that taking place maybe on a college campus or in a great you know, mixing bowl city like New York, you all kind of stay in your own enclaves, little Haiti, little Italy, you know, however else you want to call your neighborhood. And those misconceptions need to be cleared up because the stereotype, while there's a kernel of truth, absolutely, you know, that there's not that for everyone that you're going to meet. So not every African is going to be arrogant and not understanding of the racial tension here in America. I mean, they have access to the information. They have the internet over there. They have skyscrapers and beautiful buildings. They have, you know, 
companies that are taking place there that is not all what you see in the Save the Children commercials. That poverty porn is not encompassing everything that Africa is as a continent and the 54 countries that are on that continent. Remember, Africa is not a country, it's a continent. So they each have their own flags. They have governments. They have culture. They've had civilizations. Mansa Musa was the richest man ever, and he was an African. So you have something to look back at and say, you know what? We built those things. And I know that a lot of you know supremacists like to make mock that we say we're kings, but we are descendant from those things. And so you want to keep those things in mind. Now, a lot of the time we do wonder, are we kinfolk or are we just skin folk? And that's where the misconceptions come in. You don't you should be discussing those things, clearing up that while you do see lazy people, you do see people that don't want to form family units. Absolutely. They're out there. That's not everyone. And the people you meet should be a variety. Get out of your bubble and look for those people who are going to be participatory in those things. So in an effort to get the diaspora to really reconcile and come together, uh, Ghana took uh, 2019 and decided to call it the year of the return. So as I said earlier, uh, 1619 is what we call the beginning of the slave trade in the Americas, although records go back to about 1524. uh, We usually cite 1619 and 2019 was going to be the 400th anniversary. And that's the year of the return that Ghana wanted to take place and other African nations want us to return home. The idea is, and I want to read this from the website, that the year of return, Ghana 2019, is a major landmark spiritual and birthright journey inviting the global African family, the diaspora, home and abroad to mark 400 years of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in Jamestown, Virginia. The arrival of enslaved Africans marked a sordid and sad period where our kith and kin were forcefully taken away from Africa into years of deprivation, humiliation, and torture. And while August 2019 marks the 400th years since enslaved Africans arrived in the United States, the year of the return celebrates the cumulative resilience of all the victims of the transatlantic slave trade who were scattered and displaced through the world in North America, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia. So in Washington, D.C. in 2018, they decided they were going to have a ceremony with Ghana's president, uh, Nana Kufo Ado, uh, declared and formally launched that 2019 initiative. And Ghana was kind of like the poster uh, country for how it was going to take place. And I'm sure other countries participated, but Ghana was marked as a place that had a lot that was taken from them in the past. And uh, for Africans in the diaspora, they wanted to give um, African-Americans and other black uh, people around the world a fresh impetus and a quest to unite in their country, on their continent with their brothers and sisters. So it was a U.S. based initiative with the Adinkra group that was intended to encourage African diasporans to come to Africa to settle and invest in the continent. And that's an important thing to keep a, a, a mind on as well, because there were Black Americans who were already emigrating to Africa, wanting that spiritual connection, wanting that connection back to the homeland. But this was a concerted effort on the part of governments and countries to have them return to court them to come back. So in 2013, this was interesting because I didn't know that the United Nations declared 2015 to 2024 to be the international decade for people of African descent to promote respect, protection and fulfillment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms of people of African descent. The theme for the 10 year celebration is people of African descent, recognition, justice and development. Now, here's what I want to look at, because you also want to play devil's advocate a little bit. Do they want us or do they want tourist dollars and resources? Because like I said, a little suspicious. You always want to look at things with a critical view. And because there was such a drain on the continent through upwards of 80 million people being taken from that continent, uh, there was a lot that was wrong there just as much as there was a lot wrong with the people that left and were enslaved. At this point, they could be looking for people to come back and bring their dollars, their education, their resources. Uh, they, they are allowed to own property. In some countries you can buy property, you can set up your businesses, 
finish your education, raise your children and have them be citizens. Um, recently, I think uh, Ludacris became a citizen of Gabon because his wife, Yudoshi, I think is how you, you pronounce her name. Um, she is a citizen there. So now he has dual citizenship. And um, I saw a meme on Instagram that said, you know, no, Ludacris, don't leave. Don't go to Africa. When you move, we move just like that. So people had and that was another one that said, don't move to the country of Africa. <sighs> Africa is a continent, not a country. So we have to kind of look at it. You know, are they wanting us back as black Americans, maybe as, you know, Afro British citizens? Do we want those things back? And the diaspora is Colombian. The diaspora is Brazilian, especially. And do they want us there? Because like I said, that suspicion holds. There is suspicion on both sides. Are you going to be treated well? Because there are stories out there of African-Americans going and expecting to be welcomed with open arms and instead finding that the cultural differences kind of puts up a wall before you even have a chance to bring that wall down. So it's something to keep in mind. I know, especially this year, I've seen on YouTube and other articles, there are a lot of people wanting to emigrate back to Africa, back to Ghana, uh, Burkina Faso. They want to go to Liberia. They want to go to those places to feel like they have a home and feel like they have people that look like them. And I think it's important to keep in mind when you're a member of the diaspora is that while we all have a similar background, uh, there are cultural differences that you have to respect. There are differences in the way you interact and are going to interact. And you need to respect those differences and then try to understand them. So emigrating, great idea. But there are many countries, many different places you can go, many different religions. There's 54 countries, thousands of dialects and languages. And you can't just walk in someplace and think that your American privilege to an extent is going to open doors for you. It may. But you want to still be respectful of where you end up in the diaspora, wherever. Um, that's our <laughs> segment on uh, the African diaspora. I want to remind everybody that you're watching the Sunday special report on the Hip Hop Citizen live stream show. We are streaming on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. Uh, we are on all platforms. Follow us on Instagram, like us and friend us on Twitch. Uh, Find us on Instagram. Uh, we really enjoy having these shows put together for you. If you'd like to tip us, hit us up on Cash App, Hip Hop Citizen. We love to keep the lights on. So we hope that you're enjoying the discussion. So we're at the halfway mark and we want to go into our next discussion. And like I said, there's so much information that we could have topics on each of these things. We could have shows on each of these things. And if that's something that you'd like to see or if you'd like to suggest a show topic, leave a comment below or get in touch with us on our page. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd like to move into colorism. And that's another thing that within the black community needs to be discussed, brought to the forefront. Um, we need to talk about how on this map, this is what happened to us when we migrated because of the slave trade. We migrated like this. And what you're looking at is from our lightest skin to our darkest skin. And it began there. So you see that on the continent, you have the darker skin tones. You have the ones that are concentrated in Eastern Africa and flow out from there. And then as you get to the Americas, Asia and Europe, you see that it lightens. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it kind of stays darker. And that's an important thing to begin with when you talk about colorism. Colorism needs to be defined. And there's a couple of other things that we need to define as well, which I'm going to look to my notes to do. And the first thing we want to distinguish is racial traits uh, from cultural traits, since they're so often confused uh, with each other. So as defined in physical anthropology and biology, races are categories of human beings based on average differences in physical traits that are transmitted by the genes, not by blood. So that's what races are. Culture is a shared pattern of behavior and beliefs that are learned and transmitted through social communication. Now, an ethnic group is a group with a sense of cultural identity, uh, such as Czech or Jewish Americans, but it may also be a racially distinctive group. Now, a group that is racially distinctive in society may be an ethnic group as well, but not necessarily. So although racially mixed, most blacks in the United States are physically di distinguishable from whites. And they are also an ethnic group because of the distinctive culture that they have developed within the general 
American framework. So when I speak to a collective consciousness, when I speak to shared experiences, that's what makes us have a black American culture. And that's what makes us unique within the American framework as well, as we were saying here. Now, colorism defined, I found some great information. We really do need to share these links with you. Uh, the first one uh, was www.nccj.org. They had an, an article on colorism, which I'm drawing a lot of information from, uh, especially definitions and information like that. Uh, we also had a very interesting page that I found. We're going to get the website up for you here in just a second. We also found uh, www.mixedracestudies.org, which is a page dedicated to the idea of uh, mixed race information. Uh, colorismhealing.com. It discusses colorism and their roots. It's specific to the idea of something that needs to be addressed within the Black American community, something that needs to be uh, addressed overall. Uh, thought.co.com is another great website that I really enjoy learning information from, and they specifically have a page. What is colorism? Um, there was even a quick article that I got from bustle.com. It's one of those listicle, you know, lighthearted websites. So I'm not saying it's a scholarly paper, but I thought it was an interesting article from a writer on their team about the five truths about colorism that she learned as a black woman in New York City. So that was just an experiential article that she wrote. And I thought that was really interesting. So a lot of this information comes from there. Like I said, you always wanna practice your media literacy. You can look up for yourselves where I'm getting this information. Like I said, I turn and read my notes because I don't want you to think it's just my opinion for everything. We are basing opinions on fact here to the best of our ability. Now, the definition of colorism, as it was stated with the NCJJ, uh, NCCJ, excuse me, is it's a practice of discrimination by which those with lighter skin are treated more favorably than those with darker skin. This practice is a product of racism in the United States in that it upholds the white standards of beauty and benefits white people in the institutions of oppression, media, medical world, uh, corporate, etc. Now, this definition of racism is one that I ascribe to. It's the individual, cultural, and institutional beliefs and discrimination that systematically oppress people of color. And that could be Blacks, Latinx, Native Americans, uh, Indigenous, First Peoples, Asians, people of color, as well as Black Americans. Now, let's define discrimination. The mistreatment of an individual or group based on their social membership, regardless of the social power. Anyone can experience discrimination. And I always follow that up by saying it's almost like a hierarchy. You can have a bias, then you have a prejudice, you practice bigotry, and then there's racism overarching. So those are all things to keep in mind and state as important when discussing these issues. Now, colorism, everyone kind of knows the story. This started with the efforts of slave owners to keep us separated, to keep us from being a unified group, because they knew if we stayed together, unified, in one culture with each other, we could rise up. And that was the last thing they wanted, because by the time we came to the end of the slave trade, we outnumbered them. Uh, I saw one statistic that said four to one, in some areas. So we need to keep that in mind that the only way that they had to really keep us affected was psychological and sociological. The slaves with the lighter skin were assigned domestic tasks within the house, while slaves with darker skin were forced to work outside in the fields doing much more grueling tasks. Now, the lighter skinned slaves were favored because they were often the product of a slave owner raping a slave thus creating a lighter skinned child. Now, one thing that we came up with that is actually colorism within the community, and we should keep this in mind, is the paperback test. Now, I knew about this from uh, my grandmother from the Halle Berry miniseries that talked about the black Martha's Vineyard. The paperback test in the 19th and 20th century was often utilized in black spaces in the hiring of black people. If someone was the same color, or lighter skin than a paper bag, they would be allowed into the space were considered for hire. If they were any darker than a paper bag, they would not be. This is how the effects of, this is what we mean by slavery um, speaking down through generations and through centuries. A paper bag test, you can see on these bags, we have uh, the image of the Mary from Gone with the Wind. We have Janet Jackson. 
um, a young brother holding it up in this display. There were people who actually held it up to people's faces to see if they were lighter than the paper bag and then they would be more accepted. Why? Because then they would be white adjacent. They would be seen as more acceptable. They would be seen as okay because all the way back to that slave time, if you were allowed in the house, you were trusted, you were okay, you were appealing to look at, as opposed to someone that was cleaning the stalls and riding the horses and picking the cotton. This is how they set us up to deal with that. Now, another colorism result is the one drop rule. And I found a couple of uh, graphics that really speak to that because the one drop rule is another thing that permeates our black community to this day. The one drop rule has meant that anyone with a visually discernible trace of African or what used to be called Negro descent is simply black. Like that's it. If you have any form of it, you're black. And Barack Obama is a good example of that. Barack Obama is not the first black president. He's the first mixed race president. He has a white mother and African father. But he's claimed by the community because one drop rule. If you black, you black. And that's how they identified. And I want to also point out that this was used in other insidious ways. Once again, this is not something we came up with. It's just something we carry. Early in Reconstruction, it was decided that because there were mixed race people out there that were enjoying the privileges of being lighter, that if their families and generations of their families were on the voting rolls, their race was changed. There was a man in Eastern Virginia that was going on the voting rolls erasing white or erasing black or mixed or mulatto and just putting in white so that their voting block would show more white people in a certain district. So people's whole identities were erased. And it was because of that one drop rule. Now, one article I found that was interesting to me was Halle Berry was citing that she considers her mixed race daughter black because of that one drop rule. What happened is, of course, we know Hallie had a baby. And I'm going to talk about Megan and, and Harry in a second. Hallie went and had a baby with a French Canadian man. She was with him for a while. They were in a relationship. But I think everybody's heard, you know, by now with the Hollywood, that went left and bad real quick. And they were fighting very contentiously over um, custody of her daughter, Nala. Now, Nala's a beautiful little girl. Um, she is very light skinned. I think she's lighter than Hallie. She has beautiful natural hair. And Hallie contends that uh, her partner's family, Mr. Aubrey, uh, tries to erase her black identity. When she sends Nala to their home with her natural curls, she comes back with relaxed hair or straightened hair. When she's told her that, you know, she goes out and, you know, should be saying that she's a black little girl or she's had her hair embraced, she comes back with her hair undone. Or they try to tell her that, you know, they're pushing her French Canadian identity on her, not educating her on it. Then there is a difference. And so Hallie in her court papers was actually testifying that she considers her daughter black because of that one drop rule. Now, Hallie, of course, herself has had to contend with having a white mother and a black father. Hallie is considered what I would think is either she's mixed race or she's quadroom. And we're going to get into those discussions as well right now, because it all comes down to colorism and how colorism has affected us in the black community. It's something it's a discrimination that we practice on ourselves. And it's really sad to see that we practice our own prejudices and biases in our own community, hurting ourselves from the inside. And that's something why we want to address it on the show tonight. I know we can't thoroughly address it in you know, 20 or 30 minutes, but we at least want to touch on the topics that maybe you can take that information and go find out for yourself. Study for yourself. Maybe it sparks a curiosity for you to learn more about how maybe you've had a prejudice or a bias. And now you want to educate yourself to get away from it and be a unifying factor. Um, the one drop rule is something that has really permeated society. But something else I also want to discuss for a moment is the idea of passing, the idea of that lighter skin giving you, quote unquote, light skin privilege. Now, you see the ring light on me. I probably look really light. I've always considered myself just brown, you know, um, like like the ice cream with um, Method Man. I don't know why I'm acting like this. You know, what did they do? They went down the, the ice cream flavors list. Every every girl at that time that heard the song, I'm Butter Pecan Rican. And all, you know, 
they wanted to be all those ice cream colors, but nobody wanted to be the chocolate. Uh, Caramel Complected from City High. I definitely remember that song. Uh, they wanted to have that medium or lighter tone. And it was, I didn't realize at the time, of course, like I said, when I was younger, that that was something that was problematic that that was something that could be hurtful to someone that was dealing with colorism issues to an extent that you may not have been aware of. Now, the idea of people passing is something that we need to discuss because that is something that affects us to this day. There are terms for each of those things. There's mulatto, there's poblanc, there's red bone and high yellow. All those things that we sometimes joke with and and don't really think about are the things that we're contending with in the community and we need to take ownership of those things. So I'm going to read some information that I found, um, like I said, on the various websites we had. Um, PBS.org had a frontline discussion and I'm going to quote that as well. Very interesting discussion about that. Mixed race studies uh, org had a great discussion about it. So we really want you, like I said, to, and I found this on the Google. You know, I use Google as an encyclopedia. So this was information that I found on the first few pages. You know, you always want to go past the first page. This is great information that I found on the first few pages. Now, when people passed at the turn of the century, it was because there were real and violent and political consequences to being a person of color. And this is a quote from Melissa Harris Perry. She's a professor of politics and African-American studies at Princeton University. She said they passed with great danger and fear and cost. You risked everything, marriage, job, and economic security. You can't just tick off white as an identity that has been protected and policed and legislated for hundreds of years. It carries with it a package of privileges and opportunities. And that's something important to keep in mind. Whenever somebody tells you that there's no such thing as white privilege because I've had a hard life, where's my privilege? Uh, where was I ever, you know, better than you, you can say to them that life is hard for everybody, but your life wasn't made harder because of the color of your skin. So that doesn't mean that it was easier. It just means that it was different from what I've been experiencing at that same level or less than. So it's not oppression Olympics. It is not a contest and a race to the bottom. It is the idea of respecting the experiences of people that have had that experience for so long that it's ingrained in their cultural and social and economic society. It's a part of their lives down through the generations. So that's why we discuss it and why we're still discussing it to this day. If you're tired of it, you're part of the issue because we can't be tired of it. We can't get away from it. We can't turn off the TV or the radio. We live it. This is a part of our history. Now, one, the first term I want to discuss in the colorism issue is the term mulatto. Now, a lot of you probably haven't, I'm old enough in that age group to have heard this term before and heard it used in conversation. But this is a term that was originally used to mean the offspring of a pure African Negro and a pure white. Although the root meaning of mulatto in Spanish is hybrid, mulatto came to mean and include the children of unions between whites and so-called mixed Negroes. Now, a lot of this has to do with a good history in Louisiana. If you're from the area uh, or you know anything about Louisiana history, that was the part of the Americas that was seemingly passed around through everybody. You already had the indigenous peoples. You had the Acadians. You had the French. You had the British. You had the Spanish. Everybody has rolled through there at some point, owned the property. Uh, they still practice Napoleonic law in some areas of Louisiana. And so these terms were associated with the slave trade and the trading of goods and labor there. Um, we need to divorce the term black. Um, I accept it as a black American, even though I'm not that specific color. There is a social and cultural currency behind that word that makes me want to hang on to it. But some people want to get away from it. And it's understandable. Uh, what would we call ourselves in the meantime? We, through the years, we've had Negro and colored and Afro-American and then African-American. What's the next generation going to want to be called? So I'm not sure how to divorce ourselves from it, but I'm so glad that we're having this discussion. If anyone wants to call in at any time, we do have the link in the comment section and pinned. We'd love to hear from you. You don't have to just hear a talking head spouting information. Um, I do want interactive uh, live stream participation. There's no problem with that. Even if you have pushback, we'd love to hear from you and have you um, discuss those things with us. Now, another thing that people may not be familiar with unless you've studied that history in that area is quadroons. 
Quadroons appear in the second generation of continuing mixing with whites and octoroons in the third history. So now we're getting into math and fractions. I, I might lose that. Um, a quadroon is one fourth African black and thus easily classed as black in the United States. One drop. Yet three of this person's grandparents are white. An octoroon has seven white great grandparents and out of eight usually looks white or almost so. Now, that is from the PBS article that I looked up about uh, a frontline show on Jefferson and his generations, his families, and how it came down through genetics, through DNA, and how a quadroon obviously is a quarter, octoroon is an eighth, and after that, I don't know how it breaks down. But we want to look at why it seems to be a term that stuck, especially in Louisiana, and why it was used so fluidly and so easily by people. Now, uh, another thing that I want to address is Megan and Harry. And I know we had their picture up earlier, if we could put that one back up, because a lot of people wanted to look at Meghan Markle getting into the royal family and say, yes, girl, there's going to be coconut oil and bonnets in the Buckingham Palace. And yes, girl, she's our first African-American princess. Meghan doesn't identify as black. She identifies as mixed race. She has a black mother, a white father. Um, her, you know, her father is pure white. Her mother was African American, and this is the color that Megan came out. Now, I feel personally she got a little darker with the pregnancy, but that's just me. Um, and then Harry, of course, full white. He's a ginger. Everybody loves him. He seems like a sweet boy. When she got pregnant, everyone in the black community was like, "Yes, we're gonna have a black prince up in Buckingham. This is how we're gonna take back the crown. You know, he's gonna be fifth and sixth in line." Everybody had something to say, but what they didn't realize was the information that I'm giving you now. Megan being half and then marrying a white man means that most likely Archie, his name's um, Archie Harrison, Mountbatten, Rin Windsor. Uh, Archie, I think, is a quadroon. So he, Megan's half. Uh, Archie's now a fourth. And if Archie decides that he's going to marry someone who is pure white, someone German or Norwegian or Scandinavian, his child is going to be Octoroon. Because then you have to look at the grandparents. You start looking back generationally. And so it's not fair to erase Megan's, you know, mixed race identity and call her black if that's not what she wants. If she wants to identify, she wants to carry the heritage of both those things. But when you look at Megan, what do you call her? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Not mulatto, not quadroon. You probably call her red bone. You probably call her high yellow, uh, light, bright, damn near white. We've heard that before. We all have terms for it, but we're using them to call people other. We're using them in order to separate them. And that separation started way before us. And, and it's insidious and it stayed with us this whole time. That's where that debate comes from. Now, we do have a slide that speaks to the idea of French Creoles. And again, I'm going back to Louisiana because a lot of colorism was practiced there in a way that was beneficial to freed people of color, but also kind of kept them in a caste system. And um, if anybody's ever read Anne Rice's uh, The Feast of All Saints or seen the movie, oh, great movie, great miniseries, uh, great book. And it speaks to the idea of, oh, let me see what Michael's saying. One could part Cameroon, is, it, is that what one would be? So part Cameroon, part Nigerian, part Congo, and part white? I would need to know the grandparentage and who is, who is everything. Because if you've only got one white person in there, that would probably just make you mixed race. Because it wouldn't, it wouldn't make you quadroon because somebody in there, somebody would have to be white and black, then somebody's half, and then somebody marries somebody white, and then you're, you're quadroon. Like I said, it comes down to that biology, that anthropology, that DNA. You have to kind of look at that. The reason I'm going to go into the French Creoles is because in this picture, what do you see? You, you see a family, very dressed up, very prim, popper. But look at the colors. Look at the shades. This, would, is this a black family? These are considered French Creole, and a term used for French Creole of color in Louisiana that were so light-skinned and looked so white, they were called pas blanc or pas blanc, which is French for passing white. Now, French Creoles, which is uh, the commonly accepted definition of Creoles now, American blacks are from many countries. Absolutely. 
um, whether you immigrated, emigrated, whether you were born in that country and then came here and obtained your American citizenship. A lot of people make the distinction, though, because Teresa Hines Carey, um, John Carey's wife, she's African-American. She's white. You know why? She's from South Africa. So I can't say that the color of your skin automatically makes you African-American because that's a term that's a hyphenate of your identity and then where you're from. So I think that you'd be mixed race if you took out the white part. Yeah, well, Cameroon, Congo, when you're dealing with countries, those are nationalities. Those are identities. They're not necessarily races. We went over the definition before. So you would have those nationalities. And it's really unique to America to say, what are you? as opposed to in other areas, where are you from? Because I've, I've found that that's usually what happens. Like Europeans are like, where are you from? But somebody from Arkansas is, what are you? And, and that seems to be a uniquely American thing. And it has permeated other societies, but it seems to belong to us for some reason. Now, I was uh, saying Creole, the commonly accepted definition today for members of that community, um, is a mixture of mainly French, Spanish, African, and Native American heritage. So like I said, it's a little bit of everything. They are considered Creole. And they could also be called Passe pour Blanc, uh, which is French for passing for white. So I think that that's a distinction that we need to make as well. And Louisiana, uh, why I keep going to them is because they have these distinctions as one of the largest enclaves of people, of free people of color in the area. Now, free people of color had a certain level of freedom in the society, but they still had their place. They were still in a caste system as opposed to a class system. And uh, it could mean that even, like I said, Feast of All Saints, that if you were light enough, if you were mixed enough, you could be taken as a mistress and have your children benefit from being white appearing. And the Feast of All Saints uh, goes over that uh, in detail, shows the relationships, the results of the relationships. Like I said, it's a great book. Uh, It's a great mini series. I'm not sure if it's available anywhere streaming, but I I really enjoyed it because it did break down those relationships. The white plantation owners would come in and they would have a ball and it was called the quadroon ball. And those quadroons, those octroons, those white passing females would come in dressed in their finest they would you know sit in the room and basically be considered the men would come in go around the room um discuss with your parents they would discuss with your uh guardian not how much you were but if you were available and what they could offer you if you were available to be their mistress uh they also called it a protector or a protectorate And if you were white appearing enough, if you were beautiful enough, if you didn't have as many African features or a phenotype, you could be selected. You would be the mistress. You'd have your own house. You'd have your own staff. Your children would be taken care of, sent off for an education to the European continent, and you would be set. You were definitely not getting the benefits of being a married woman and having land available to you or generational wealth or any kind of connections like that. But Pas Blanc, Pas Pour Blanc uh, became a societal norm for freed people of color in Louisiana, in New Orleans, in Baton Rouge, in those areas. So it's something to consider as well. That colorism was also practiced by them because, like I said, uh, you could have a half sibling who, because of their African phenotype and their skin color, could be your handmaid. They could be your servant. And it just depended on what shade you came in. And the colorism is still practiced within us today. We want to make sure that we try to get it out, that we try to understand why it's happening, why there seems to be jealousy, why there seems to be that prejudice amongst us. It happens in our everyday life, even not even historically. Um, Everyday life, I want to go over, and this is something that I didn't realize when I was doing my research, and I'm glad I found it at the last minute. Um, Black children are actually aware of society's preference for lighter skin. And I remember seeing this because they've done this study a couple of times in modern times as well. The 1940s doll test confirms lighter skin preference. I'm not sure if you guys were familiar with the doll test. 60% of the African-American children, we'll say African-American, ages three to seven, preferred the white doll and assigned positive characteristics to it. And I think this test took place again on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, early on in the show, they they did this test again. 
and it came out the same. When they were given a choice between the two dolls, the white blonde baby doll, you know, generic baby doll, and the black baby doll, the black little girls, like I said, between three and seven chose the white doll because they had already picked up on society's preferences for a light or white skin. They didn't want to see themselves. In fact, I distinctly remember the image of a little girl turning the black doll over. And it's powerful. It's visceral to realize that it affects children already in everyday life, in everyday society. Now, yes, we've come a long way. It's the 21st century. There's so many black baby dolls and cartoons and images they can look to, which is why representation is important. But that's why we go through the history lesson, because it's important to understand where that came from in the first place. It's important to understand why it still permeates our society to this day. Um, I know from my experience when I was um, in school and just friends I hung around with, even in Greek life, like the Divine Nine, um, they're divided by skin color, whether they like to admit it or not. Because think about it. If you think about AKAs, green and pink, who are the AKAs? The light skinned girls. Who are the Omegas? The dark skin boys, Zeta Phi Beta, dark skin girls, you know, the Kappas, red and white, uh, the light, you know, the light skin pretty boys. And yes, there are mixtures in each one. Your whole chapter can be all black girls. We know that. But the general consensus was that that's how you guys were separated. And I think it's because it's, it's like I said, it's historical, it's generational, it's been ingrained in us. And Michael, thank you so much for your comments. I do see them. Um, we're going along in the discussion. I appreciate you participating. Would love it if you called in and participated as well. Women and men perpetuate the stereotype. W women like to blame men a lot for pitching the idea of colorism. And while they do tend to have their preferences, women do too. They don't want a guy who's, you know, black smiles. I can see where you're at in the dark. Like, women do that too. So while they can say that they enjoy a chocolate brother or whoever else, think about it when it really comes down to it. Do they want the Al B. Shores? Do they want the Chico de Barges? Or do they want, you know, Tyrese and Tyson Beckford? I'm probably aging myself of <laughs> saying those names. I'm sure somebody in the chat can give me a more modern version. But we both pretend you know, perpetuate those stereotypes. I can't say it's one sex over the other. However, when it comes to hip hop, because this is hip hop citizen, don't tell me you can't see that that hasn't been in the music and the videos since the beginning. Like I can specifically say, because I'm in that generation, you know, the golden age of hip hop, where songs and videos were determining which men and women were acceptable. I distinctly remember like in the 90s to early 2000s dark-skinned women were the bomb like there's this one girl that was in every video she was in peaches and cream she was in 112 she was in you know only you and they were all about her but then the early 2000s kind of came in and the light-skinned girls are starting to get the shine you had the ashantis you had you know j-lo trying to do her thing and it started to get a little okay they're getting a little lighter and then by now everything switched from even light skin to racially ambiguous. Like, is she Cubano? It, you know, Cubana, is she, you know, from the islands? Yeah. <laughs> Half Hawaiian with a slight touch of Chinese. A go face say that. See, that's what I'm saying. Like the Blasian girls and, you know, uh, what else? Pacific Islander. They wanted the, just like 50 Cent and Lil Wayne were saying every day, the exotical women. And I'm just like, OK, so that's why it always sounds like men are perpetuating it. But, hey, women are participating in it because are you the one that's trying to put yourself to the front because you feel you're lighter? Or are you dissing and, and tearing down another woman because of the color of her skin or the grade of her hair? This is my failed twist out, by the way. Welcome to it. We've got to be careful about that, because in everyday life, this is who it's affecting. It's affecting a four year old. It's affecting a seven year old, a 16 year old. You know, and the songs and videos like it determines what's acceptable as black. Childish Gambino ha called his single Redbone. And I just have to go back to that and just say, you know what? I have to, you know, give everybody the side eye because a lot of what we say and do is going to be affecting us and our thought process. And it's going to be affecting the people around us. But guess what? We're all mixed. 
We are all mixed. Geneticists believe that virtually all African Americans have white blood. And we're talking about us in the United States. Harvard University professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. culled data from five DNA testing sites and found that the average African American had between 19% and 29% white ancestry. Now, while some subjects showed as much as 95% African industry, none of the African-American subjects tested by the five ancestry groups was found to have no European blood. All were effectively multiracial. Let me say that again. While some subjects showed as much as 95% African ancestry, none of the African-Americans showed no European blood. We're all mixed. Whatever color we came out, if you're born on American soil of American parents who have who were black or African descent, honey, you mixed. Everybody's mixed. Mixed is not always about gray eyes and red hair. Mixed is not always about, you know, 360 waves and, you know, good skin and good hair. Love that one. That's a whole other topic. Uh, We're all mixed. If you're an American and you've been living here and you can count back five generations, honey, you mixed. So it's not something exotic. It's not something unusual. It's just for some reason, something that we took and ran with. And like I said, study your history. Why are we running with it? Why is there colorism in our community? Why are we still perpetuating it when we know from our history that it's something that was done to us? Psychologically to separate us. And it continues down to this day. Um, I want to also talk about a little bit 50 and Little Wayne, because sometimes it is the men and Gilbert Arenas. So 50 and Little Wayne were on Little Wayne's podcast, Tunchi. And for some reason, nobody, nobody at all. 50 Cent decided that he was going to talk about black women for a second. And that's where I said that he was coming out with. And see, look at this beautiful picture. I would love to have that girl's skin. Ugh. Um, the one on the end, she's so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I'm envious, trust me, all these age freckles. Um, he started talking about how, you know, black women are always angry and how he likes a woman who's like Arab and has her own shit together. You know, she's got the Ferrari straight off the boat and she's not giving me any trouble because she's already got her own. And, you know, little Wayne is sitting there kiki in with his three dreads on his head. And everybody's just like, why are they talking about us? Why are they even talking about this? Lil Wayne has a whole black daughter. And so Regine responded and she just said, I am beautiful. I'm a queen. I love myself every day. And I hope everybody else does too. That's how she let her father know that was not cool. And I'm okay. I have my own self-esteem. I'll be fine. Gilbert Arenas is another one. Nobody. Nobody at all. And here he came tipping because somebody a few years ago, I think it was three or four years ago, had put up this picture, you know, top 10 beautiful black women or actresses or something like that. And they addressed Lupita Nyong'o, uh, Lupita from Black Panther and other movies. She's um, modeled. She's absolutely gorgeous. And she definitely has a darker skin tone. For some reason, Gilbert Arenas felt that he was going to speak on it and basically say that she wasn't like fine. Um, she was ugly in the face, but her body was banging. I mean, he has so much to say. And of course, black Twitter came for him and they tried to check him, but he doubled down. Well, now that we're in the middle of this crisis in a nation where we're uprising over police reform and criminal justice based on, you know, racial inequality, again, nobody, nobody at all. Here comes Gilbert Arenas talking about, well, I just want to apologize for the idiot I was all those years ago when I was young. It was four years ago. And just, you know, apologize to Lapita and let her know that um, now Lapita, of course, was not bothered. Uh, He needs to take 2020 scenes. 2020 needs to get a hold of him. Maybe the murder hornets or the, you know, sniper bears, whoever. Uh, He he needed to take several seats. Lupita stayed unbothered and gorgeous. And what about her business? She minded the business that pays her. So I don't understand where he where these guys are just coming out the woodwork and giving their opinions when nobody asked you. Ain't nobody ask you, though. Like you can have your preferences, but leave black women out of it. I have a meme like that on my timeline right now. Date who you want, but shut the fuck up about black women. Nobody asked you. This has been going on since Wesley Snipes and his, you know, fetish for Asian women. And that's another thing that happens. Men tend to fetishize women from other ethnicities. 
they think Asian women will be submissive and white girls will just, you know, do what they're told and be grateful to be with you. And did you put that up again from Ghostface? Um, they have all these stereotypes on their own, fetishizing these other women. Arab women are going to be rich and, you know, hook you up, you know, with Saudi princes or something like Get out of here with that. What needs to happen is that other men need to be checking them. Because then they disregard black women. So they don't care about our disapproval. Black women checking men doesn't do anything to them. They're just like, oh, you bunch of angry, dark skinned bitches. You just jealous. So it needs to be other men checking other men and saying that's not cool. Not that we need protection, but it would just be nice to have some backup. It would be nice to have somebody saying, no, I got this. I got this. No, we don't need special protection. We can absolutely handle our own, but they're not listening to us anyway. If they're willing to call you, you know, angry all the time, if they're willing to call you out your name and say that your skin is ugly, what makes you think they value your opinion? So now don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't bother with them. Leave them where they are. Men should be stepping in to talk to other men about that. It's it's a mess. That goes into another subject. Should black women burn the cape? I saw a comment section when Gilbert, you know, came out with his hobo apology tour and they were saying in the comment section you know what let's just burn the cape why are we always putting ourselves out there and by caping they meant why should we always come to the rescue and defend them speaking you know to black men when they are always putting us down casting us aside they have nothing nice to say about it why should we keep you know coming in dun, da, 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 and putting our bodies on the line and putting our reputations and, and self on the line especially in the protests that have been happening lately when they aren't even willing on twitter to you know say nice things So uh, women are having that discussion. You got to be careful about that. And it's something to think about. Are black women emasculating? Always angry, confrontational. Well, you know what? There's a reason. Try, Try to think beyond your nose and figure that out. I know that a lot of women, you know, cite musical references like Karen White, Superwoman. Little Mo had Superwoman. She wanted to fly in a rescue and just be with you. Destiny's Child wants a soldier. When it comes to men, you know, you've got to be a certain way. In a future show, we're going to be examining black love, uh, what it means. You know, should it be salt and pepper? What a man. Um, Angie Stone had brother. Alicia Keys had unbreakable. Uh, We need those things to happen. And so we want that to be uh, something we discuss in a future show that we're going to be going over, where, which is where is the black love? And I think that's important to discuss when it comes to the colorism debate and how it affects us as well. Um, There's a lot that comes down through the history, reaches its tentacles out in an insidious way and affects the way that we interact with each other. And I think it's important to realize that we've got more in common than we do have different. And it's important for any type of unity that we have to have unity from within first. Um, The last topic we're going to go over today, like I said, there was so much information and so much that we could have done. These could have been all shows by themselves. But we wanted to make this part two of do all black people and their lives matter to all black people. These are the things that we touch on when we talk about our black lives. How are we affected by the diaspora and the, and the transatlantic slave trade where we were separated? How are we affected by how colorism is still perpetuated in our society? We want to talk about the LGBTQ community. Now, the stigma of being in the LGBTQ community is already there. Then you add being black into the mix. And those are discriminations and prejudices that are just piling and stacking on top of them. Now, the first thing I want to say is that I am an ally for those lives. So I would never tolerate on my show anyone that's going to come in and say that they don't matter, say that, you know, they're sinful and they're going to die. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. But what I will tell you for my show, because I'm the diva and these are my views, is that I'm a strong ally. And on this platform, we're going to respect them. I have seen what they've gone through in their lives. I have been with them as as they've cried and dealt with emotional and physical pain. So there is no way that I'm not going to, I'm not going to be an advocate and use my voice as best I can in my lane to support these people. Now let's first go over what the acronym stands for because I know a lot of people like to joke and say oh it's the alphabet community. Don't be dismissive. Don't be reductive. This is what these letters stand for. L is for lesbian, G is for gay, B is for bisexual, T is for transsexual, we're transgender now, Uh, Q is for queer, we've also had um, I for intersex and A for asexual. I'm sure there's other initialisms that I'm missing, um, but those are what it stands for. Most people go with LGBTQ. 
They have their pride flags as the color of the rainbow. And I think recently they've also added black and brown to acknowledge the intersectionality of the struggles that black and brown people face, not only within that community, but also in the outside forces. Now, the stigma of being different, does that make them invisible within our community? Because there's a stigma within the community itself of being trans, of being a person of color. Um, within the community, I've heard them talk about how there are people who have prejudices against certain types. They don't want someone black to be a partner or a marriage partner, just a sex partner. They don't want someone Asian because they don't think they'll be you know, sexually attractive. They have their own prejudices. But then in the black community, we have prejudices that are steeped in uh, a religious background. We have, um, uh, we have a background that's steeped in, you know, being taught that it was wrong, that, you know, this is not natural. And there are definitely people who still believe that. And like I said, you can believe that. But over here, we're going to be supportive and we're going to love those people as people. Uh, one thing I want to do is talk about the Stonewall riots, because some people have to go all the way back to that education to talk about why they have a struggle and why it's important to respect the struggle. So the Stonewall riots were Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. They were two transgender activists, and they're actually going to get a permanent installation in Greenwich Village in New York to honor their uprising on that night. Um, on that night in 1969 in June, the Stonewall uprising was when they fought police who had raided the gay bar on Christopher Street. What they had been going through is that for years, New York City cops were going through these bars, which were not out in the open. They didn't have, you know, cutesy names or anything. Uh, going through, raiding the place, kicking people out, beating people up in alleys, and then going on their merry way. Or they would shake down the owners of these bars because it was still illegal in some areas not to have those bars and to have men coming in dressed as in women's clothes, participating in homosexuality, they were looking for people basically to fill quotas on tickets. Well, finally, they got tired of it at the Stonewall Inn. And when the police came, pushed everybody into the street and started beating on them and pushing them around, the myth goes that Marsha is the one who picked up a brick and threw it back at the police and started the uprising, also called the Stonewall Riots. And that's what started the the catalyst to the gay rights movement in the 70s that began then and still goes on today. So that's something that we have to respect. What you want to know is that Marsha P. Johnson was a queer uh, black person. Sylvia Rivera was a person of color. She had a Hispanic background. And they started in 1970 and eventually disbanded um, Star Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. It was a group dedicated to helping homeless young queer teens. Now, of course, we don't use transvestite anymore. We use uh, transsexual, transgender uh, to respect the, the label that the person has. And we want to address their statistics about how they are harmed and why it's important to look at those too. Because in the graphic that we have right here, this is not just a graphic. Trans people are 370% more likely to be brutalized by the police than cis, cisgender, hetero people. And then being black on top of that just escalates those statistics. If you look them up, you can look them up on Google. Trans people killed in 2018, 2019, 2020. Those numbers are going up. I believe when I heard on the news the other day, it was 26 people so far. Mostly black people people, they were black people, people of color, they were trans women that were out by themselves, that were, you know, walking away from a protest, that were hunted down by people to be killed. And it's not like on TV where, oh, they were tricking and a John found out, you know, they were, uh, had a package downstairs and decided to kill them out of rage. These were people living their lives. And then they had their life taken from them. Was it because of their color? Was it because of their sexuality? Or do they intersect? And I have a tweet that I screenshotted and hopefully the producer can bring it up here because I wanna talk about how a lot of people in the black community feel like the LGBTQ community is trying to co-opt our movement, our civil rights movement. And that's not always the case, they intersect. And what this person said in the tweet really made sense to me. She said the intersectional nature of bigotry is the, why the fight for LGBTQ rights and BLM are congruent movements. We have the same oppressors. Every single proud boy who hates me for being bi is also a huge racist. Of course, they're ableist too. Most people are. So I think that's important to look at too. It's not that 
they are trying to co-opt. And even this year, uh, oh yeah, there's no self-respecting queen would touch that hair. I think they were talking about Ken and Karen um, when the protesters broke down the gate and went into the, the mayor's neighborhood. It was actually the wrong neighborhood and they were standing on the lawn practicing a lack of gun safety. This is in relation to, to Ken and Karen. But I think it's important to see that it's an intersectionality, but nobody's trying to take over. And a lot of people in the black community figure that the gay rights movement compares itself to the civil rights movement in an effort to overtake us and to um, deflect from us. But that's not the case, because like this graphic is showing, love is a human right. It's not something that we should be breaking down to say only you can love a certain way and only you can, you know, these people are okay to love each other, but these people aren't. And I've always said, man, if you could find somebody who loves you, it doesn't matter who it is. Go ahead. Because the rest of us are like, you know, single for life. It's like if you find somebody that loves you, stay with it. Love is love. You need to be able to have that, too. And what that affects in the black community is that a lot of black people have that stigma and make it worse because they don't want to be accepting of them. And a lot of it is religious. A lot of it is because they're taught in you know, the Baptists and, and Amy Zion, they're taught that it's a sin, you're going to hell, you're never going to be right, you know, you're unclean. And yet those same people in the church and the choir, have you looked at your choir director? They are all over. If we did gay for a day, like there was a movie like that one day, honey, things would shut down. So just like if you did when they did immigrant for a day, black person for a day, it wouldn't be right. We're all here to experience this life and we should be free to experience this life in our best way. That is their best way. You know what? Representation matters. Laverne Cox is a transgender woman who spoke in this uh, great documentary I found on Netflix called Disclosure. And they talked about how tokenism takes place in Hollywood, in media, in fashion. They feel that, it, you know, if they have that one trans person that's on the show or that one trans model at the Victoria's Secret show, that they've done their part. They're all set. And that happens to black people, too. Again, intersectionality. Oh, well, we had that one black model. So we're good. We're diverse. That's not the case. That's not what representation is. And uh, Yance Ford, who is this great uh, transgender filmmaker, mentioned this quote and I really liked it. Um, he said, I cannot be in the world until I see that I am in the world. So just like we want representation for the members of the black community, we want black women out there, we want black men out there um, to play our parts and to play our parts correctly. Um, they want that too. They want to be represented in a positive light. They don't want to always be seen as something to make people sick. They specifically mentioned Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, and Crying Game had just come out a few years earlier, and they tried to make it seem like he was sick because he had discovered that you know the woman that he was interested in was also trans transgender, and so everybody was throwing up everywhere. They don't want to be associated with that. They do not want to be associated with that. Absolutely. James Baldwin, Bear Rustin. James Baldwin is just a fabulous orator and a great writer. And he should definitely be, you know, heralded as someone who took that intersectionality and brought it to the forefront. And so it's always going to be a fight, but we shouldn't have it be a fight in our community. If we're going to support and say that all black lives, lives, lives matter, excuse me, if we are going to say that all black lives matter, all black lives have to matter. That includes the LGBTQ that includes the trans, that includes bisexuality, that includes everybody. If you decide that you want to pick and choose, you know what, that's on you. The rest of us will do the heavy lifting. The rest of us will do the work and be supportive. But don't ever use that phrase again. It's hard to reconcile. And I know that's going to be for some people. And if you want the short answer, and I should have said this in the beginning, if you want the short answer for whether or not all black lives matter to all black people, it depends. That's a short answer. But we're going to talk about that towards the end of the show. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do quick housekeeping. This is the Hip Hop Citizen live stream. You're watching the Sunday Special Report with Diva Views. I'm the Diva. These are my views. But we're also talking about topics that are hip hop adjacent and how they affect our citizens of the community and what we can do to educate ourselves about these topics and learn more so that we can be better as we go out and be functioning members of the Hip Hop Citizen Society. We're on all social platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitch, Periscope, Instagram. Uh, follow us, like, subscribe, uh, like the videos. If you're listening to us on the replay, welcome. 
Uh, we appreciate you watching and share the stream. If you think that there's somebody you want to have this discussion with, and if you agree with points, if you disagree with points, if you've learned something tonight, absolutely take that with you. Uh, as we're speaking about the LGBT community, like I said, I turn and look because I'm looking at a lot of notes because uh, I'm just that person. And uh, in the music industry is where we want to touch on lastly, because, of course, we're a hip hop show. And we want to talk about how in the music industry, you don't find a lot of representation. At least you didn't before. Now that we're in the 20th, uh, 20th, you know, the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, still 20 years in, still the beginning. Um, it's a little more accepted to be out out and proud um, in the music industry. But it's not just uh, Little Nas X, it's not just the brat. And the brat, uh, a lot of people found funny because when she officially came out, she's with Big Booty Judy and she said this on her Instagram, everybody's looking at her like, we already knew, we we're just waiting for you, sis. And people were not checking for her sexuality or her private life. They just liked her as a person. They liked her on Dish Nation, they liked her, um, as a person and in her music. So everybody was just like, all right. <laughs> um, and of course, young MA, I love her music. And I think she's really cool. So um, we have a clip of her freestyling on our channel. Uh, that's a really cool freestyle. Like she could spit like right off the top. So that's great. Um, but gay men have always been referred to derisively. We knew Don Juan, we knew. <laughs> we knew, sis, you didn't have to come out, you know. Um, Gay men have always been referred to derisively, especially in reggae songs. And I'm going to be a little stereotypical here. A lot of, like, I, I had some West Indian Caribbean friends and, uh, like, from St. Kitts and, and Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and they definitely had, like, this visceral reaction to the idea of anybody gay being around them, um, met, talking about gay things. They didn't want to watch Will and Grace with me because they thought they'd catch the gay through the TV. I mean, it was special. And for people to think like that to me was funny and amusing because I'm like, what? It's just, it's just a person. It's a part of who they are. It's a part of their identity. You know, it's not who, it's not their whole thing. It's not their whole identity. It's a part of them. And I accept that with them. But especially Jamaican men, like you're going to find it like Bounty Killer and everybody else talking about boom, bye, bye with a batty boy. You remember that song? That's about hurting Black men and who were considered gay in Jamaica, I think it's still a crime. Somebody can correct me on that. Um, they will kill you if they find you. I think um, the author of Stellar Got a Groove Back, her husband, in the end, tell me her name, um, married her to get off the island and then divorced her and came out as gay. And he came out a few years later and said, well, it was because I was trying to get out of there because otherwise they would kill me if they found out. I'm like, dang. So is this reaction that not everybody has, but in the music industry is where people take a lot of their cues from and in media. So I think that's why it's important to have that representation there. Um, a lot of people think that there's not a lot going on in the industry when it comes to being LGBTQ and that um, not everybody is okay with it. Gary, you did not hear a kid and player married. Uh, <laughs> quit, quit it. Um, now names I kept seeing across different le um, lists of notable queer hip hop artists. So when I was doing my research, I went through all these different um, online magazines like Billboard and um, The Root. Uh, I think there was one called Integrity. Uh, the first person that we have here on the screen, we're going to go in order, is Big Frida, the queen of New Orleans Bounce. Everybody knows Big Frida by this time. Uh, Beyonce's featured her. Uh, Big Frida is a big deal. We've got Zebra Cats. Uh, I think Cakes the Killer is another one that's out. Quaidash is a transgender um, hip hop artist. We've got Rose. Uh, she was formerly known as Angel Hayes. So mo most people might know her as Angel Hayes right here. Uh, Leaf. Leaf is uh, another artist that was part of the Brock Hampton collective at one point. And I'm going to get to Brock Hampton in a second. Princess Nokia is another hip hop artist. These are all people you should look up and check out their work. Uh, Mickey Blanco and uh, Brock Hampton. Now, Brock Hampton, I think is interesting. They are a self-proclaimed boy band of 10 members. It fluctuates in and out of hip hop artists and rappers. Um, they were also represented, I think, Odd Future, because Tyler, the creator, has been associated with them. Tyler, creator, another artist who everyone believes is queer, but he won't talk about it, um, which you shouldn't force anybody or try to out them. That's a PSA. Uh, some other artists that I know have come out and identified as queer is Bad Bunny. Uh, I listen to a lot of reggaeton, too, and he's come out, 
you know, in a couple of videos dressed in drag or, you know, gender fluid, non-binary um, outfits. Jay Boogie identifies as queer. These are the voices that are fighting for representation in the industry to be recognized and to be accepted and not be that token, not be the first of something. And I found a lot of information that was really interesting because uh, one quote that I found, and I think it was on the Root article about LGBTQ um, hip hop artists, that hip hop as the unapologetic expression of black experiences will always exist above the biases that individual artists have historically brought to it. What hip hop is at its very core, an outlet for the disenfranchised black youth to express our realities through art. I thought it was a perfect way to express what hip hop is. You feel cut off. You feel like something's happening to you and you want to express it and you want people to understand it and you use your art to do that. That's what hip hop is. And they are using hip hop as well to identify in their community and to let people know what they're going through uh, with that representation. Uh, Richie Rosario is a music journalist and producer who has had work on Vibe, Teen Vogue and XXL. Now, he points out that hip hop often pushes for more traditional imagery in order to align with the beliefs in the black community. That means more macho men and more over sexualized women are thrust to the forefront. Those are the stereotypes of what they think will of music industry people think will appeal to black people. Let's keep that in mind. They think all we want are macho men and over sexualized women. Is there a section of them that that want that? Yeah. But that doesn't have to be all of us because we're not a monolith. We can enjoy other things. Um, he had some really great quotes here. It's instilled in our culture and many others that men can't express femininity. We always have to be strong. Um, this is an article from The Root. It's the same type of thing in hip hop. And a lot of these ideas go back to the black church. Oh, God, don't like that. Now, I'm not downing the church. It has an important um place in our culture and how we come together as a community. But we have to say that those are the backgrounds of the beliefs that come in and make it a stigma to be queer, to be gay, to have lesbian relationships. Now, labels and music companies need to do a better job at marketing these queer artists. We have to have the agency and autonomy to express themselves as they want to. Don't use the community as a prop to make the music seem cute or cheeky. And Cakes to Killer also was in this article, and he was saying the whole idea of being the first shouldn't be the only reason that you listen to somebody or that you take that on, because then that's that tokenism that nobody enjoys, and it becomes obvious that you're the token. I don't know um, one artist who said they were participating on the show um, Rhythm and Flow, and then Cardi B was on there, and she was a judge, and it was that um, hip hop talent show that was only on Netflix. I don't know if anybody's seen Rhythm and Flow. I didn't watch it. But a lot of artists that were queer um, participated in that show. And Cardi B was trying to get them to say, like, how does it feel to be the first? How does it feel to, you know, want to be, you know, the first this, the first that? And a person says, I don't have to be the first. I just want to be me. So it looks like we have a caller here. Caller, uh, who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello? Oh, I guess we lost them. Technology, folks, it is a live show. So uh, another thing that hip hop allies need to understand is that their words and actions can be alienating. Uh, one person that they brought up, and I know the barbs are going to love this, was Nicki Minaj. Now, during the beginning of her career, Nicki toyed with bisexuality during performances and in songs such as Usher's Little Freak. And in 2010, she told Rolling Stone that she acted that she liked women to get attention. Hello? 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 Hey, welcome to the show. You're on Sunday Special Report. Have you been listening to the show so far? Yeah, yeah, I have. And uh, what would you like to discuss with us? Hello? Uh, hello? Oh, there um, you are. Mic isn't working. Oh, okay. You're fine. You're fine. So uh, what part of the discussion would you like to go over with us today? We talked about colorism, the diaspora, and now we're talking about queer representation and hip hop. What would you like to add? Um, so I think we should talk more about like how, like, what do we say?
like the importance uh, of the black lives. So, uh -huh. absolutely. And I see your tag is, is hashtag Black Lives Matter. That's what we're discussing today. Do they all matter to everyone? Yeah, it's a it's a national organization that is chapter based. So individual chapters work to enact change in their communities and they utilize the methods like most effective for them. So that is absolutely true. And I'm glad that you made that point. There are individual chapters that come out from the organization. There's BLM Atlanta, BLM DC, uh, BLM in Minneapolis has come to the forefront. And where are you calling from tonight? Um, I'm calling from Abu Dhabi, which is in the UAE. Uh, in the UAE. Oh, well, thank you for being up so late and listening to us. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping you're enjoying the show. What's your name? Or what's your pseudonym if you, you don't want to give your name? Um, you know, I'll just call you Honey Child. So, Honey Child, we appreciate you <laughs> listening from Abu Dhabi. Um, thank you so much for your English. I know you're probably practicing, but you sound great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you are very welcome. And it looks like we have another caller coming in here. Do you want to stay on the line, Honey Child? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh. Okay, you can stay with us and have this discussion. And, sir, where are you calling from? And uh, how, what may we address you as? Are you talking to me? Yes, sir. Um, my name's Clip. Hey, thank hey. you so much for listening. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Woodstock. What's, okay, well, say hey to Honey Child. She's calling all the way from the UAE. All right. <laughs> I'm Lego. Hey there. Hey so, there. what would you like to discuss with us tonight? We've uh, been going uh, over queer representation, colorism, and the diaspora. What would you like to touch on? Oh, uh, well, probably all of them. All of <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. You've got the floor. Okay. Well, colorism is the, like, maybe the main thing that I'm, I'm thinking about. Okay. Because I, I started to think about, like, why why in our black community do we have like you know like we can't on some days get it together uh. okay so think about it we we come from a, a lot of uh different uh, cultures originally before we were uh mixed by slaves that's why i was saying even if you took away the white thing we still be mixed because True when they got us over here, they got us over here by separating us so that we wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to communicate, like you said, um, and that we'd be able to rebel against them. So yeah. that would mean that the community of, of Africans that they had was some Africans from, that probably were Muslim Africans, some Africans that probably did some whole other ways of praying uh, Tribal religions, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you probably looked over at the, you know, uh, somebody from the Congo or somebody from uh, dark Africa yeah, from, would from look over country. at a at a uh, a brown skinned guy from say Senegal or Cameroon or, or Ghana and say he's too light. Mm -hmm. and, and Honey uh, Child, what were you saying? I'm I'm just gonna let Honey Child get a word in here. What were you saying, sweetheart? And so, like, we should be active because countless young people, like, especially the young Black Latino men and women, they've been the victims of p police brutality and other forms of institutional racism in all around the world. So, yeah. absolutely, and that's what we're suffering and, and from. It is, it is like that. I was once. I was in uh, Tunisia, and. Uh, Everybody there was seemed to be like light skin, you know what I mean? Mm. But then there was like a brother that was the doorman and he was blue black. And he said to oh. me, it's like, you know, we even got that same problem here. Then I watched the thing the other day and it was on like the Hindu 
people. I don't know if that's the proper term for them, but East Indian. They, yeah, for for Indians, they had the same problem: dark skinned Indians, and and whatever is, is their normal complexion. You know, it's they about have complexion. a complexion. Yeah, yeah, they have a caste system based on their skin tone. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and if you you know you look around America, like I grew up, I'm well into my 60s. But when I grew up, you know, there's square-headed people that may be from Zaire, some kind of egghead dude, maybe from, you know, uh, somebody's head is shaped like an eight. He may be from the Congo. Some, <laughs> you, you dig what I'm saying? So. Like yeah, I haven't seen that phenotype, but I, you you're breaking it down. I haven't thought haven't about investigated, that before. We haven't investigated. We're looking at a look. We're looking at uh, the oppressor, or what what we call the oppressor, and the mm -hmm. oppressor is from like some much smaller continent, uh, Europe, which is like, you know, Ireland would be Ohio, if you look at yeah. it in in terms of the size. So, right. so just Africa is like so much larger than all of that. that the United can't... States could fit in Northern Africa. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So honey yeah. child, let me, let me ask honey child, honey child, do you, you sound a little young. I'm not trying to, you know, age you, but have you learned anything about black American history or African history where you're from? Or, you know, you've picked up on BLM, which we absolutely are a part of and support at hip hop citizen. What have you been learning? Yeah, exactly. Like uh, sometimes about public opinion, like American public opinion can sometimes be, seem very stubborn. So oh. voters haven't really changed their views on abortion for maybe 50 years or something. Yeah. And I think that, you know, voters are looking for a change because we are in the middle of this uprising. Like you were bringing it up, brother. It's we are learning so much about ourselves even now that we haven't been taught. We're not being taught in schools. There is so much we're going over. And that's why I do such deep dives and so much reading I have to do. There's stuff I'm still discovering. Well, no, hey, another thing is, is that we as as descendants of slaves, I learned this when I was over in Europe. Uh, some people th have used this term that we are the great experiment. So if you if you look at it, the, I like once I was over in in France, and the guy said to me like, and this is way before the 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 right even before Rodney King, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, oh, we hear that you American, you know, you are like so oppressed by the police and da 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 da. I'm like, okay, cool, I get that because I'm from Detroit, I, you know, we're the first ones to put police in check. So, right. so I get that part, but then when I had to turn around and explain to an African, somebody from Africa, that an even bigger problem is, I don't know if you want to show up in Detroit because you may get shot by a black man. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's a dilemma that we need to deal with, even in our hood, that way that we can deal with the rest of the world uh, they're kind of waiting on us. Like we, we look good. Black Lives Matter. It looks good, but we mm -hmm. got to be not necessarily as unified. But we got to be a little bit more, have more clarity in what we're talking about. Because thank you. Because because yeah. what we're what we're talking about is going to either be the uplift of blacks all worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know or the demise of blacks worldwide because even in the, I, I, even in the, yeah go ahead even in, go ahead. in the communities that have like already like done their holocaust and oppressions and stuff yep. when you, when you get amongst them they're so divided and when you get amongst white folks they're divided they call mm -hmm. it you know i never use the term uh white trash or or cracker, but I learned I learned there's those terms because there's a caste system within the white communities. There's this uppity kind of thing that don't ever deal with white trash. There's this uppity kind of thing that they're not crackers, uh, or they're crackers and we're not. 
and they're doing that kind of thing. We in the black community do a, do a lot of that thing of, I don't like the way he looked at me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it goes back to that. And like Honey Child was saying, you know, we have to start using our voice, like you said, not as unified, but we all have to get in the same lane. Yeah. We all have to get into um, what we want to do and what we want to see and make our demands clear and have some clarity on the vision. There doesn't necessarily need to be one um, leader. There doesn't necessarily have to be exactly. you know, one person. Like everyone should be leaders. Yeah, everybody should exactly. be leaders, and you know, everyone should be leaders, and everyone like I think it would and be also, a beautiful thing if we pick. And also, like uh, some of this comes from social media because, like, mm. some of this is simply the way our media is set up to host uh, like debates about whether it's true that some lives matter more than others, but it's also the way like uh, the complaints of racial injustice have always been invalidated. So they're turned into matters of opinion and they're removed from the realm of moral justice. Right. And so and we don't racial equality and they're easily framed as unprovoked assaults on our terrorist culture. Like mm. it's it's not a good thing because it comes from it all comes from social media. Where where are you where where are you, young lady? Honey Child is in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Ah. So she's just she's just preaching tonight. She's dropping her gems because of what she's learned. Yeah, I mean, and 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 the deal is, like I said, we have to be represented. We can't we cannot afford anymore to have like a a, a inter battle. In a, in yeah. Black America, yeah, like yeah. some kind of way, we're gonna have to like make sure that some brothers that don't make us look good get put exactly. over it, put somewhere else, like nowhere oh, yeah. where <laughs> like the cameras go, are at. Because, go somewhere, <laughs> yeah, go somewhere, but but you don't <laughs> represent the whole thing because there's like what we represent is like so much wider than just being this white black thing, and if we it's, like if, if we stay on it too long like we'll have more equity Way if we could long. go back to the countries that we you know not not go back to africa but go back find out what where our lineage is from uh -huh. pick one that is an economical economically uh sane and makes sense because there's grants out there that that black americans could get that just go you know you have people that say I'm sending money back to Spain. I'm sending money back to Mexico. I'm sending money yeah. back to Ireland. I'm sending money back to Italy. Okay. And we as black Americans don't have any place that we actually rep. Yeah. No. We, and if we rep something, you know, if we decide to rep something, uh, um, uh, I think our power base would be, would be, a little slicker. Absolutely. The buying power and the, the monetary economy of black Americans, we could be the third largest economy in the world if we all put it together. Yeah. And I think once we realize our power, it that's where the uprising will continue to be a movement because this is just not a moment. It's a movement. And well, I'm the, deal sorry. Is, the deal is putting it together is actually like dispersing it or, or divvying it up. Yeah. See, because if we go all just black, okay, we black, then th that's just a it's a one on one contest. It's like us versus them. That's the anybody, right. anybody that's not black can can go against what we're talking about. But if we yeah, if we pick up our, uh, you know, get our thinking to think that we're wider, we represent a wider scope, and it's just not on complexion. You can look right. around. It's not on. It's not just complexion. It's like one time I one time I was sat at a table, um, and I was overseas. I sat at a table with a guy from Zaire, a guy from Baltimore, a guy from uh, Algeria, a guy from Ghana, and a guy from uh, the Congo. Oh, okay. okay. So now we're all sitting there. Some are Muslim. Some speak English. Some don't speak English. Some speak French, based on. Uh, 
who were the uh, colonizers. So, right. so, so. Yeah, it's like, it's not, it's not some kind of argument. It's like black and whites also differ in their opinions about the best approach for improving race relations. Amongst whites, more than twice as many say that in order to improve race relations, it is more important to focus on what different racial and ethnic groups have in common. Right. One thing oh, that yeah. one thing one thing if you go if you went on a lighter hue a lighter hue scale versus the, the, the darker hue scale. Okay. Yeah. Lighter hue scale say, well, you know, I'm part Italian and my family, I you know, we 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 do some things like um we talk about blacks have, have more single uh single mothers. I have, oh, yeah. I've met more I've met more white guys in Europe who don't know their dads. Wow. They know what country they may have come from before they split, but they don't yeah. know them like that. So for us to even, sometimes when we get into that guy-girl thing amongst black, yeah. black Americans, yeah. that, one, that blurries up the thing too. Because yeah. that changes the whole subject from how much white yeah. Wider our, our, our scope is, and our I think scope, that's why. Oh, go ahead. And what's what's scary for the lighter hue folks is that if we ever figured out our own little our own little differences, then those differences are not like uh, uh, differences to be mad about, but to, to say, "Wow, your people!" Like you know, I could look at you and say, "Oh, are some of your people Dutch." Uh, did your people come from Suriname or something? You know, you'd be like, "Yeah, what is people Suriname?" I see. Always it's... have their own differences. Like no one can be judged by their differences. No one can be judged by their looks. Right, it's just not yeah. right. Honey Child made a lot of good point, and I think even where she's from, the UAE, they may have that same idea. And they bring in, uh, I know in the area like Oman or Qatar and Dubai, they bring in a lot of East Indian and Thailand and Singaporean workers and immigrant workers. And there's definitely a caste system with that, too, if they're darker, if they're lighter, where they end up working. And I think that's what's experienced. But it's like you said, it's a caste system. It's a it's class a warfare yeah. as opposed to color. And yeah. that's where yeah. we have our differences. We were talking about colorism for that exact reason. You know, Gina, Tisha Campbell from Martin is definitely red bone. You know, right. kid from Kid and Play is high yellow. Right. We make those distinctions because they were made about us first. Right. And it's just stuck. Yeah, but we don't have to we don't have to defend why we, why we went there. We're there. We are already there. there. Yeah. And so, we want to work on it like Honey Child was saying, we need to get our thoughts together, our demands together. That's another show that we had. What are your demands when it comes to Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter? Right. Uh, what are your demands? What do you want to see change? Talk to the people who can make those changes happen and make sure those changes happen. Honey Child, I'm going to have um, actually seen yeah. your show sometimes but i haven't really uh attended any calls so oh well thank you i'm so glad you called in tonight i'm glad yeah, honey you... Child, you rock yeah i know look at all her knowledge that she's dropping girl you better come in here you know every week and stay with sunday special report we love to have you Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, child, I'm going to let you go. I know it's late, but I definitely want you to keep watching. Make sure you share the replay with your friends. Like, share, follow, and subscribe, sweetheart. You have a great, what is it, night, morning in Abu Dhabi? Yeah, it's morning. Have a great morning, sweetheart. Get some sleep. All right, bye. Peace. Bye. And Cliff, thank you so much for calling in. I'm so glad that you tuned in and was dropping knowledge, too. Between our age groups, we know what we've seen and what we hope to see. Yeah. And I hope that we continue to have these conversations so that we can educate, inform ourselves, make sure that all the information is getting out however we can. Because it, it's important in this moment. And I'm so sorry that people are sick of BLM. Think how sick we are of having to come up with BLM. Well, BLM, what well, we had to be, what we had to do with BLM, because I, 
I, I try not to like I, I've been through the riots of sixty seven uh-huh. in, in Detroit. So I, I get I get what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I I think now in this new age of doing things, we get compromised, uh get thrown out there and get kind of get thrown off course. So we have uh-huh. to be careful of that part. Um uh and we have to also show like like I got a I got a problem in hip hop with because I'm not hip hop at all. I'm, no. No, I'm an old funkadelic. I'm a member oh, of the Parliament okay. Funkadelic. Okay. Okay. So, not mad at that at all. Yeah. So I'm 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 just I'm coming from. I'm hip hop because I you know I can dig it. Is there's no hip hop that I don't like. Right. But, uh, but uh, I don't rep that. I rep uh-huh. what I do, and yeah. um, uh. I just know that somewhere, even if we get somebody to say something, you know, absurd, white folks get to be as absurd as they want, but they they, they make sure that the conversation that they that they keep their bullhorns going, that they yep. keep talking. And yep. I, for me, it's uh, I thought that that the that the time that uh, in the time that say somebody like. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Jesus, Jesus Walk. What's oh, Kanye. 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 Okay, for us to let him go. Uh, I thought I thought we missed the time to teach <laughs> because we we we're like we're very touchy when it, black folks are very touchy in America. When you mean? just don't, you know, like if somebody says to me, um, "God is good." You know, and the typical response from us all to be co- politically correct is all the time. All the well, time. <laughs> right. It's not my response. And, you know, if you say God is good, I'd be like, yeah, yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. now, that, now already I'm not playing the game. Yeah, and I don't right, think, right. I don't think that we, we need to be like, uh, uh, obligated to play the game that way and so like right. somebody like Kanye said something completely off that was a moment to teach as as opposed to us all becoming the judge it, yeah you know what I mean and yeah because, did you see there's more, Kanye's press there's conference more, there's more young black men that don't get it like Kanye so for us to cut Kanye off was a little bit uncool. That's what I'm saying. It's like, okay. you know, you, you give LGBT and I love, love everybody, but mm-hmm. we'll give that thing. There's been, there's been, it wasn't LGBT. It was like sissies and, and that wasn't a bad term. It was just, yeah. you know, you had your sissies there and they did their thing. They always did their thing. It's nothing new. The civil rights thing has been like, Probably the the most um, uh, knowledgeable people in the civil rights thing were the sissies or the queers. Yeah. Okay. And I already threw the names out there. Okay. Yeah, we yeah we we go yeah. with those terms from old time. You're saying them in that context, yeah. so, so I know you're not, not trying to be like offensive. So shocked. Let's not act like we're so shocked, but we have to be strategic on how we how we deal with it. I, yeah. There was there was a thing. There was a thing that was called the One Nation. It was a some One Nation on the Mall. Okay. And it was a pile of people out there. You know, there was tens and tens of thousands of people. And the first thing that 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 happened, like I said, maybe the after two or three speeches, that the, the next speech was a, a guy who came in a nurse's outfit. And he was there, and he gave this this speech that lasted for a half hour, and you emptied the mall. Now there's more information to share. And I'm not trying to be prejudiced, but it's like, be strategic. If you know know that's going to... You still need these brothers that do work out, that do uh, marry and have kids, and they don't stay in that fight long with that as the as the entertainment. So you had to like be strategic as when you put people on platforms. 
we need to keep some. We need to keep people there. And uh, I don't know if you can say that anybody is is worth uh, uh, not having there. But we just have to be strategic, like as black okay. people overall. Yeah. When we, when we get a platform and we get a camera and we get the microphone going in and we got the people there to listen, we don't have to be as fair. We have to be a little bit shrewd. As a, yeah, it's like we're so is everything programming is everything. Yeah, we're so eager to have that acceptance and to include everybody that wants We've to be an ally. We've accepted that a long, long time ago. We accepted that. That's accepted. Let's not that get it twisted. We we want everybody so included that we forget to get our message in the forefront and make sure that we are heard first, and then we can bring you along. But we right. need to keep our message loud and consistent. It's black and first. Need, it's it black needs first. to be consistent. Yeah, right. it's black first. Okay. But yeah. it includes everybody with us, but we're it all is. going the same direction. We're all just in our different lanes. Exactly. But we're all going the same direction. Well, that's and that's what I think people should keep in mind. Well, and, and the deal is like, in the terms of democracy, democracy is is very touchy. See, mm -hmm. we're very, we're very PC, and by yeah. us being so PC, we're ruining our own game. I mean, there are some things you should be blunt about, but I always tell, like, especially my other panelists, that you can still be mindful and you can still, you know, take other people's compassion, empathy, emotions and consideration. You mm -hmm. can get your message across, but yeah. let's be mindful about how, you, like you said, let's be shrewd and strategic about how you get your point across without having to make it about other people. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be like I'm not going to stand in the audience and be like, get that dude off the thing. Like he's, you know. I could care less what he mm -hmm. does. Matter of fact, if he loves, if he likes it, I love it, and I'm with him. That's the on, phrase. Yeah, on, for you know whatever it is, because that's that's everybody's private private life anyway. Like well, I, I'm not, I'm not interested gonna, in I'm that. I'm not going to even yeah. walk up to a ex, a straight guy with his wife and say, "Tell me what's that like." All right, Tell like I'm not interested in that. that. I'm, I'm not interested. My thing. In the issues, I'm right. interested in how you feel about things. What's your behavior? What's your stance? I'm not exactly. interested in in behind closed doors unless it affects me. Right. Like don't be beating people behind closed doors and then tell me you're great. Like right, right, right. That's that's nuance. That's yeah. nuance. Yeah. But clip, we're gonna start winding things up. I appreciate you so much for um coming in. We've been on for two solid hours and everybody's been rocking with us the whole time. Can we have you call in again next week? We're gonna be uh, talking about black love. I be mean, I love to. Okay, we hope that you sh uh, show up and show out, okay? All right, now. All take, right, you take care of yourself. Take care of that young lady. Thank you. We have had so many um, great comments. We've had so many great participations. We have been on here for two hours. I think this is one of my longest shows, but there was so much that we needed to go over. There were so many deep dives that we needed to take. We were talking about LGBT communication and representation in hip hop. And I think I'm going to go ahead and just wrap it up with Cakes the Killer. He said, you have to have these tough conversations. So I think allies need to have the conversations because that's how you educate people. And you have to do the work now. And sometimes when you do the work, it makes things uncomfortable. And I think that's not only about queer representation. I think that's about representation for anybody. I think that goes to anything that we're talking about. Of course, we welcome allies. Of course, we want everyone to feel included in helping us. But we've got to make sure that those tough conversations are taking place so that they understand where we're coming from. And I have a note written down that fits perfectly into this um, discussion that we're having. Um, and it mentions, if you're going to choose to insert yourself in a particular community or want to help tell their story, you need to realize the privileges that you have and realize life for them is different. And honey child, I see you staying with us. Um, still speaking. I see you out there paying attention and wanting to help. Honey, you can help by continuing to educate yourself and educate others. Make sure you spread the word with positivity and information, which is key. And make sure you stay literate in the media about what information you take in and then what information that you put out there. Our allies are important, but we have to make sure that we're putting ourselves out there to get our message across first. And absolutely, honey child, action speaks louder than words. We not only want to amplify our voices, we also want our voices in the room where it happens. 
I watch a lot of Hamilton. Um, we want to make sure that we are in those places, that we are doing the legislating, that we are voting, that we are out there banging on those doors at the polling places, taking a lawn chair and sitting in that voting line. We want to make sure that we're at those council meetings locally. We want to make sure that we're volunteering to help our own people with Habitat for Humanity and at food banks. Show up and show out. Pull up and be a part of everything that's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. With going back to our original question, do all black lives matter to all black people? And like I said, halfway through the show, it depends. It depends. There is no yes or no answer because it ends up being subjective. It's complicated and messy, just like life is. Uh, we have our biases. We have our prejudices in our community and from outside forces. But the more that we educate ourselves about each other, the more we can accept ourselves and come together. And ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you for such a great conversation that we had tonight, discussing part two of our series, Do All Black Lives Matter to All Black People? I think that the question has to stay out there so we can all come up with our own answers and make sure that we're in a place where, like I said, we're all moving forward, but we all have a lane. So continue to work in that lane you're in and make sure that the message stays out there because we are still fighting for justice for Brianna, Elijah, Ahmad, George. We are still fighting just because you don't see as many protests, just because it's not the front page of the news anymore. That does not mean that the fight has ended. It's still going on. And we want you guys to continue to participate. So thank you so much for tuning in to Sunday Special Report. This has been Hip Hop Citizen Livestream Show. We are on all social media platforms. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook. We are on Twitch. So we hope you'll follow us. Uh, share the stream. And if you want to have those discussions or start those discussions, this is a great place to start. We've had so much information that we've conveyed. I will try my best to put up a lot of the links that I used in comment sections and in description boxes so you can find us again and use that information for yourselves. Like, share, follow, and subscribe. If you'd like to tip us, we're on uh, Cash App at Hip Hop Citizen. And we hope that you'll tune in next week where our topic next week will be, where is the love? Where is the black love? in parentheses. So we hope to talk to you then. Ladies and gentlemen, good night.